Welcome, everybody, to this eighth in the series of London Futurist Hangout on Air discussions, where we bring a panel of uh, worldwide uh, futurists, uh, writers, technologists together to discuss uh, an important scenario about the next three to 40 years, a scenario that may have very radical repercussions. And on this occasion, we are discussing the scenario of uh, increasingly intelligent intelligence, AI, that AI will reach human levels and then go rapidly beyond human levels in a way that will cause all of us a lot of regret. That potentially the AIs that uh, will be designed over the next decades will do what we tell them to do, do what we have wished them to do, but then they will end up implementing it in ways that we had not foreseen and we wish that we had in carefully instructed them a little bit more precisely, but by then it may be too late. That's the scenario. It is a Hollywood scenario uh, and the question is should we be taking that seriously? Is this something that uh, deserves uh, serious attention or is this just a bit of fun, a bit of hype, a bit of uh, exaggeration? And I know James Barrett, our main speaker for today, has given a great deal of thought to this, as indeed all the speakers uh, on today's panel have done. And we're going to focus a lot of our discussion on themes that James has explored in his book. Uh, James has a long history as a documentary maker, covered a whole range of fascinating subjects. Uh, James, can you please tell us why did you find the need to write this book, uh, Our Final Invention? And what did you discover in the process of that? Uh, I wrote Our Final Invention for a couple of reasons. The, the main reason is because advanced AI is a dual-use technology like nuclear fission, capable of uh, great good and great harm. Um, intelligence is different from all of the technologies uh, because it's the, it's, the, it's the technology that creates other technologies. Um, and I think we're going to have problems with advanced AI all the way up to the develop, through the development to uh, AGI, or human level intelligence, and beyond to super intelligence. I think even right now, we're seeing real problems with its dual use in the NSA scandal in the United States, which is basically a problem with uh, advanced data mining tools, which are, is AI. I think we're about to walk into a gigantic debate about autonomous drones and battlefield robots, again, advanced AI. So we're gonna have, we're gonna have problems with this development. Our innovation is gonna run far ahead of our stewardship right up to superintelligence. The other reason I wrote the book was because I think it's time for, uh, I wanted to help uh, bring AI risk into mainstream discussion because I think it's been uh, in, in the, the purview of academics for a long time. And I think uh, it's, time to, it's, it's time to help nudge it into the mainstream. As a result of writing the book, what do you feel that you've learned? How do things turn out differently from how you might have expected? Well, I think a lot more people, a lot more programmers and uh, people involved in AI, mostly, um, I didn't write about my opinions, but I wrote about the opinions of people I, people I interviewed, and they were AI makers, AI theorists, and uh, people involved in computational neuroscience, people uh, writing a variety of AI applications. Um, a lot of people getting DARPA grants, um, and I found that uh, a couple of things. One is is that most of the people I spoke with shared a great deal of apprehension about uh, advanced AI in the future. In fact, everybody I spoke with said uh, agreed with the idea that in a hundred years, and I think human level intelligence will uh, and super intelligence will be here sooner than that. But they agreed with the idea that in a hundred years, most of the decision decisions that affect our lives would be made by machines. And, and from there I started asking, well, is it, is it, a, is it a handover, is it a takeover, is, it, is this a friendly transition or a hostile transition? And I was surprised at how many people who are really working in, in AI uh, believe that it would be a, a, a pretty uh, a transition that we would not be in charge of. So that was, the new, that was news to me, I had not anticipated that. So a wide number of people saw a takeover rather than a handover. Yes, yes. They see accidents happening uh, on the way towards, uh, towards uh, AGI or artificial, just, to, just for the audience, you should probably define that term. Um, AGI is artificial general intelligence, which is human, human intelligence. And then we talk about super intelligence as being smarter than human intelligence. 
And so, uh, yeah, a lot of people uh, working in, in AI are, uh, anticipate um, that we'll have accidents on the development path to, uh, to, to AGI and beyond, and that uh, the outcome may not be good for, for, for humans. Many thanks, James. Uh, let's introduce uh, the other panelists one by one before we dive more deeply into the discussion. I'd like to bring in Jan Tallinn now, who has uh, a long history as a software engineer. In fact, there are quite a few software engineers on the panel, so we know a thing or two about building complex systems and then seeing the complex systems sometimes uh, reacting in ways we hadn't fully anticipated. So, Jan, what's your view about this general question? Is uh, emerging AI likely to go off on its own uh, initiative, or is it likely to uh, be something that uh, humans can easily control? Hello. Uh, well, there's obviously a lot of uh, uncertainty in, uh, uh, in thinking about uh, machines that are potentially inter more intelligent than you are. Uh, in fact, uh, science fiction author Werner Winch uh, actually coined the term singularity as a result of uh, uh, seeing there is some kind of event horizon in the future that corresponds to uh, there being uh, more intelligent actors in the scene uh, than the author. Uh, but uh, like, so that there are several arguments uh, that uh, should be can, can be made uh, just from the fact that uh, that there is this big uncertainty uh, about uh, uh, about what what will happen if the uh, if we will have to share uh, the environment uh, with uh, agent or agents uh, that are more intelligent uh, uh, than people, so so like just from this uh, uncertainty, uh, one can one can say that uh, uh, it basically is prudent to be careful and think think things through before we uh, before we uh, actually uh, go ahead and and do such things. And there's another argument uh, that says that uh, like people have like too polarized view about uh, AIs or AGIs. They think that they, AGIs are either friendly or they are hostile. Uh, so that we get like this utopia or we get dystopia. Like actually, there's an argument that says that it, most likely the AIs are just going to be indifferent. And uh, but the problem with indifferent is that. Uh, from our perspective, uh, sharing an environment uh, with uh, uh, with an agent that is more powerful than us in controlling that environment, as it co and is completely indifferent from from indifferent to humans, is still like uh, existential threat. Uh, we there is a still a significant chance that uh, even even the AIs uh, that are indifferent to us, they still might be interested in the same resources. They just want their atoms. Uh, therefore, uh, it, we unless we have very strong evidence that the uh, AI uh, that we will be creating will automatically be uh, sort of friendly and benevolent uh, to us and, uh, more importantly, to our environment, uh, we should be careful and, and do more research into, into figuring things out. Many thanks, Jan. Uh, come back to some of these questions as well now. I'd like to introduce at this stage uh, William Hertling, who is uh, also by profession, I think, a software engineer working in HP. Uh, you have written uh, a number of uh, novels based on potential scenarios for AI, so I guess as a novelist it's your, in your interest to hype the possibility that AI might emerge. And wh what's your reason for thinking it, it could be something uh, a serious issue rather than just a matter of uh, uh, chatter? The, I mean, we've already seen serious issues with dumb AI, um, whether you're talking about Wall Street trading or anything like that. The potential, um, without even having intelligence, is, um, you know, that it can wreck our global economy, right, in a, in, a, in a moment. So as you wire up AI to yet more devices and yet more of the world around us, um, there's going to be errors. And, Certainly as a software developer, right, I know that there's always problems in software, <coughs> and they will be no less true for AI. Um, and when you get to having, you know, human level or better intelligence, then you do have to deal with both the fact that that's going to continue to accelerate, um, whether that's a hard or soft takeoff, um, it's going to continue to accelerate, and then what do you do when you have people who don't have the same motivations as you? Um, and they're in control of most of the infrastructure. 
So it makes for good sci-fi novels um, because I think it's scary for most people because it seems so immediate. Um, when the most common reaction I get to my books are, my God, this could be happening right now and we don't even know about it. Thanks, William. Uh, the final member of the panel we have with us today is uh, Callum Chase. Uh, Callum, uh, what's your take on the plausibility of the general uh, story that AIs might uh, execute a takeover uh, from humans uh, against our will, rather than being uh, just a tool that uh, do, does exactly what we would wish them and want them to do? I, I think it's highly plausible. I share James's motivation for writing about this whole space. I, I'm staggered that we face a situation where we may have, it's not certain at all, but we may have uh, human level conscious machines within 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It may happen, could, could well happen. And almost all of the people on this planet are not thinking about it. Those machines, when they, if and when they arrive, they may be friendly, they may like us, they may want to help us. They may hate us. They may think that we're a virus, a vermin. Uh, they may think humans don't play very nicely with strangers. Sooner or later, one of the humans is going to want to turn me, the artificial intelligence, off, so I'll launch a preemptive strike and get rid of the humans. They may be completely indifferent to us, and that may hurt us in all sorts of ways. They may want uh, our resources, in, in the famous phrase, which I think James quotes in the book, uh, the, the AI doesn't like you, it doesn't hate you, it just has answers for the atoms that you're made of. Um, but another thing that may happen is, as a, as a species, we may find it can be debilitating to find ourselves thoroughly outclassed in the area that we had as our own, which is intelligence. Um, so they could be damaging to us in all sorts of terminal ways. And I, and I just find it absolutely amazing that so few people are thinking about this. Well, perhaps the reason why so few people are thinking about it is uh, uh, represented by the question I've just elevated, which is by Samuel Matthews. Uh, Samuel points out, in his view, uh, progress towards intelligent AI has been uh, fairly slow. Uh, uh, people have been predicting the success with artificial intelligence for a long, long time. Alan Turing in uh, 1950 thought it would be quite likely that we'd have uh, suitably intelligent uh, AIs by the year 2000, and that hasn't happened. So what makes the panelists think that advanced AI will become super intelligent any time soon? I think that's a good enough question that I'd like to hear uh, comments from uh, all the panelists on that, and I'll come back to you, James, to kick that discussion off. Sure. I think we're going to see, um, I think we'll see AGI, you know, it, it, nobody, nobody ever got rich guessing on when AGI would come about. But um, I was at a, a meeting of people who were trying to create AGI, and the, the mean date was about uh, 2030 to 2035 that people were estimating it would come about. And there, but the reason, uh, so that's what that's what the experts say. Ray Kurzweil is famous for saying um, by 2029 we'll have uh, fully vir virtual human brains by by reverse engineering brains, and then a uh, the singularity by 2045. Um, I think that the, the biggest reason that I anticipate we'll get there in the next couple of decades is because of the amount of money that's going into it right now. All the different players that are going into it, that are, that are working on it. We know that Google is interested in, in, in AGI, and they've hired Ray Kurzweil to be the chief of engineering. We know that IBM is, uh, they've, there's a, a really good book that's just been put out by the Watson team, by the, the computer that beat the humans at Jeopardy. Um, called smart machines, and their cognitive computing is really a, a very persuasive way to get to AGI uh, reasonably quickly. And Watson was the first member of that new species of cognitive computers, cognitive architectures. Um, then you've got, so you've got major companies aiming for AGI. Then you've got DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in the United States, which has an immense budget. So many of the uh, AI programmers I spoke with and interviewed uh, we're working from DARPA funds at least part of the time. So DARPA's, DARPA's interested in it. Um, and the NSA, with a $50 billion black budget, and this is the NSA that just abused uh, the U.S. Constitution with uh, the data mining software, um, they, they want it. They have $50 billion. $50 billion that they don't, it's a black budget. So I think that there are a lot of deep pockets for whom 
Uh, AGI is a, an extremely, extremely attractive product. Um, and I think we need to look at, you know, who, who's, who's, who's paying for AGI, uh, why is it a priority? And um, we'll see that, the, you know, the, the Pentagon kind of spilled the beans a little bit last week by saying by 2030, they want 30% of combat forces to be automated. And that doesn't mean just battlefield robots. That means battlefield robots and battlefield uh, munitions carriers, battlefield resupply. Um, but they want 20, they want 30% uh, automation by 2030. So that tells you um, there's a lot there's a lot of dollars going into creating smarter and smarter machines. So I think follow the money and it'll it'll, it'll show you where uh, where AGI is going to pop out. Um, and in my guess is you know within a couple of decades. Thanks, James. Uh, let me give that same question to Jan and just to emphasize the point of view I've seen some people raise, which is that simply because people are spending money on a problem doesn't guarantee it's going to be solved. You know, people invest speculatively just in case. But what is the grounds for thinking that the money will actually uh, have the p potential to come, come true in the investment uh, by, say, 2030, 2040, 2050? Uh, well, I think, uh, of course, like mo throwing money at the problem doesn't necessarily solve it, but uh, it's an argument can be made that uh, uh, it helps. Uh, and uh, more, more importantly, having more people thinking about uh, problems uh, you know, covers larger solution space. Therefore, uh, it's uh, it's basically an indication of uh, like it's correlated with progress. Like, in AI in general, if you look at AI history, there's a, like a certain seasonality there. Like AI summers uh, alternate with AI winters, and uh, like it's obvious see, that I think it's obvious that uh, if we are going to get to a human level AI or superhuman level AI, it's going to it's more likely to happen during an AI summer uh, than than winter, and that the reason why summers uh, AI summers uh, alternate with winters is that uh, you will get this, uh, well, it's like a typical investment cycle. You, you get uh, uh, like an increasing demand uh, for, for AI talent, which basically creates uh, additional supply, uh, which actually at some point creates supply that is just fake. Uh, therefore, uh, at some point, investor, investors will, uh, uh, will suffer losses, at which point the uh, whole AI thing will, will go out of fashion, uh, and we, we get AI winter. We, and then we have something a new spark uh, that will bring the AI summer back. Uh, so clearly, right now we are uh, probably, I think it's AI spring. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, going to accelerate now. So one argument is that uh, like, if it's going, like, it might not happen this summer, but it might might happen next summer, And, and uh, uh, but it's a lot more likely to happen during the summer than winter. But a more general argument is that uh, uh, if we, concede that this is a planet-changing event, then it's uh, really not enough to uh, argue uh, from, uh, uh, from like induction, saying that, OK, this doesn't happen. This hasn't ha happened. Therefore, we shouldn't worry about it. It's like, like uh, if you know that there's a, there might be a bomb, uh, like a 10% there's 10 probability that there's a bomb in, in, the, uh, in an airplane, like, uh, like people will not uh, say that okay, it's probably there's, there's, it's unlikely that there's a bomb in, in, in the airplane. Therefore, let's just fly. And then uh, like this airplane hasn't uh, uh, suffered a bomb attack before. Therefore, like uh, let's just go. I, I think it's the, we should basically uh, look at from the other other way around. So like, are there strong evidence? Is there strong evidence that AI is not going to happen soon? And if there is, then then we shouldn't worry about it. Otherwise, we should. I know in the past, John, you've spoken about a computing overhang, the possibility that uh, if we one day find a better algorithm, we'll suddenly see that uh, these algorithms can take advantage of uh, the vast hardware power that already exists, and that uh, it might be in quite a short period of time yes, that there will so, be a so, transformation. So uh, one way of putting it is that, that if you look at the progress of computer chess, uh, then uh, uh, and measure it by, by amount of moves uh, or, or amount of search space uh, that the uh, comp computer opponent is able to cover, analyze, uh, then, 
there is there is a progress in both hardware and software, and turns out that that progress in software has actually been quicker. Uh, so it is possible that uh, as the hardware gets more and more powerful, we are just uh, kind of uh, the AI software side is is uh, somehow stuck in in some kind of local minimum. That is just trying to get out of, and and once once actually somebody has a great great idea, it will uh, progress, and and we have seen that like the AI progress like if you if you plot the progress of uh, like voice recognition for example, you see that there there are like uh, periods of periods where where very little happens, and then the, then there's like a significant progress uh, like over a relatively short time. So what what might happen is that uh, that it comes comes back to this. Uh, uh, soft takeoff versus high, hard takeoff uh, uh, argument. Like if, if the if we will see a soft takeoff, uh, then uh, uh, AI would be much closer to technology as any other. We will have ability to kind of steer it as a society. However, if if we will see a hard takeoff, we will just be too slow uh, to uh, to react. Therefore, as the hardware gets more and more powerful, the probability of hard takeoff actually, actually hard takeoff actually increases. Because there might be sort of uh, air pockets uh, forming in the uh, in the hardware capability uh, that might be kind of quickly filled up by by AI that is able to analyze its own code, etc. Thanks, uh, William. Why do you think the advanced AI may become super intelligent anytime soon? Well, you know, I think about the history of flight and how the Wright brothers basically. Um, you know, achieved flight not because they made huge innovations in building an airframe, but because they had for the first time a powerful enough engine to achieve powered flight. Um, and had there been engines that powerful a hundred years before, we would have seen more advances in flight a hundred years earlier. So it really came down to that engine. And so similarly, for the past 40 years, there's been work in AI, but they were really working, you know, with like horse-drawn computers, right? They were just nowhere near the class of power that they needed to solve the problems they wanted to solve. Um, now we're getting into that realm, which opens up two interesting things. Um, up until, for the last 40 years, most AI research was done in research labs that had the funding to do this um, at a very big scale, right? IBM's Watson, $3 million worth of hardware. Well, in 10 years, that $3 million worth of hardware will be the computer that we all have at our home, which means that you're going to have far more people contributing to the field of AI because you're going to have hobbyists involved uh, in the same way that you know the Netflix prize inspired thousands of teams to contribute to machine learning for affinity algorithms. Uh, so we'll see even more people entering the field and the hardware that's the right you know, class of hardware for solving these problems. Thanks. Uh, let me address the question which uh, Phil Wheat has uh, raised in the questions and answers. He's basically saying, what metrics should we use to measure AI against human intelligence? And uh, the, question, the way I'd like to pose that question is, well, we're talking a lot about intelligence. Uh, what do we actually mean? Uh, and how can we measure, uh, therefore, the progress in, in a general sense towards a human intelligence? Anybody want to answer that? Sure. Uh, Happy. Please, John. Yeah. Uh, me or? Yes, please, John. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there is this uh, mathematically fairly rigorous concept of uh, optimization power. What it means is that you, uh, if you have an agent that has certain goals, uh, you can measure the agent's ability. That is optimization power by looking at how capable it is uh, in uh, steering the world towards configurations that are high in its preference order. Therefore, like for example, if you imagine a chess computer, like one way of uh, measuring the optimization power of a, of a chess program is to look at the, just look at the space of all possible endings for the game, or, or enumerate all the, all the possible endings or endings for the game. And then, then see that, uh, uh, like, how probable is, uh, how capable is uh, uh, the computer steering the uh, game towards uh, configurations where it has won. 
or, or, or drawn versus where, where, it, where it loses. Therefore, you can just look at all the, possibility, all the possible outcomes and then like if you're pitting two agents against each other that, that share the same playground, so to speak, be it the uh, chessboard or be it the world, uh, you can uh, compare the agent's ability by, by seeing uh, like how strongly it is able to uh, control the world, basically. So there is a, a, a mathematical expression there which can be used. Does yes. anybody else want to give a definition yeah. of a general intelligence? James? Well, yeah, sure. Um, it's, you know, AI experts bounce around with um, definitions for intelligence. I think Jan's is a really good one right there. But you could, what Jan is sort of saying is, uh, goes back to a fairly common uh, AI definition, and that's, Intelligence is the ability to achieve goals in novel environments and to learn. And that's something that, that's, you know, you can say that 20 different ways, but that's sort of the essence of it. It's got to be goal achieving. It's got to, uh, it's got to learn. And it's got to be, uh, it's, it should be mobile. It should be able to, uh, to take on new environments. And that suggests that it might be embodied, that it might, that, the, that, the, that something that's intelligent might have to have a body of some kind. Some, of some kind, or a way to uh, to exert its will on the environment. Uh, I think IBM again uh, has been good at uh, putting up, you know, kicking the football through, you know, human goalposts. You know, Deep Blue lost a number of times before finally before it beat Gary Kasparov and became chess grand champion. Um, I thought uh, IBM's. I thought. Playing Jeopardy, the, the TV game show, was very audacious, and it was a really good metric to say not to say that it's achieved human general intelligence, but that it's uh, it's it's mastered a, a niche uh, part of human level intelligence. The AI has done really well at this very narrow application, but the narrow application really isn't so narrow. Jeopardy is is quite nuanced, um, and I think similarly, the Turing test has been a benchmark for so long. You know, people. Poo poo the Turing test, but I think it's got a, a, a it's it's really good because it like like Jeopardy, it takes account of human language, it takes account of common sense. Um, IBM's Watson had 200 million pages of word meanings and definitions, and the entire content contents of Wikipedia. It had a huge ontology or common sense database. So. Uh, the Turing test will, ha will be, have to be similarly equipped and a whole lot more. And that just acknowledges that human intelligence isn't simply a, uh, is it, it's not, it's, it's an optimization process, but it's an optimization process in a quite complex world. And just the communication part of that world, a communication part of that space is, uh, is, is quite an accomplishment. It, it, making headway in that is, is, a, is a big deal to me. So you see evidence of progress in quite a number of uh, ways of measuring uh, human intelligence. There's a question by Randall Kuna, which uh, I'd like to elevate. Uh, Randall points out that there are many commentators, such as Gary Marcus, James Abauer, and other experts in cognitive and neuroscience, who say that despite all the progress that people point out, uh, progress in things like deep learning, HTM and other neocortex-like AI approaches, that they're quite far from being a, a overall human a, skills. Uh, they are looking at one particular angle on it, and so uh, it's still, uh, well, is, is that something of concern? Uh, uh, does this undermine the argument, because they, each of these are just a particular, particular approaches, or d do you think that a, there will be some integration of these uh, approaches uh, in a way that will, will come, come quite soon. Shall I take that? Yes, please. Thanks, Colin. Um, Randall raises a good point. There are, there are a lot of people who know a great deal about the AI field who are very skeptical, and they think that it's either impossible to create a conscious machine or it's going to happen a long way in the future. But equally, there's an awful lot of people who are in the field who think it is possible, and Randall, frankly, is one of them. Um, we don't yet know which group is right, but there's a lot of smart people who do think it's possible, who are, as James said, they've got access to a great deal of money, 
Uh, the Paul Allen Center for Brain Research reckons there's about 10,000 labs around the world working on this problem. So we don't know where it's going to come from, although probably the people with the biggest bucks are going to get there first. Um, so the bottom line is we don't yet know whether it's possible, and we don't yet know when it will happen if it does. But there seems to be a very good chance that it will, will happen and soon, which is why we, we, you know, it's good that we're having this conversation. Anybody else want to so, comment at any point so far? Sure. In 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 my mind, uh, it's import, important to kind of draw a distinction between sort of functional intelligence and uh, and uh, uh, kind of human-like intelligence. Uh, so, like, uh, like it's I, it's entirely possible to kind of uh, lose out to machines that are not conscious. Therefore, therefore, like. Uh, uh, Therefore, we should uh, kind of uh, set the set the issue of consciousness aside for a moment and think about uh, how how do we make sure that we are not just going to lose. It would be arguably it would be even worse if we, if we lose to lose the machines that are, that are not conscious. Uh, now, actually, I discussed this uh, uh, issue uh, with my uh, uh, partners at uh, MetaMed uh, uh, about uh, basically the, the issue is like how. Uh, Deep, we have to go uh, before uh, before we uh, are approaching the level of human intelligence uh, in, in terms of, uh, like for example, simulation. What level of human brain uh, structure we need to simulate in order to reproduce uh, uh, human functionality? And uh, for example, do we have to go to quantum effects? Uh, and uh, one argument against that uh, that against that we have to like go to much deeper than we are considering is that if human human brain would be able to tap into quantum effects or things like that, then we should arguably uh, see much stronger evidence or much kind of qualitatively different uh, performance. Or like we should be able to point to things that human brain does, and it's, it's clearly beyond the ability of machines to to do that. But uh, like in my view, there really isn't uh, like very uh, setting aside the, again the consciousness issue. Uh, for a moment, uh, there isn't like any human performance that like obviously outside of human, outside of machine, reach these days. I think that's a really good point um, that Jan just made about about you know it's a it's a really open question: is consciousness necessary for intelligence? I think, um, and I think William's example of the airplane is really good. You know, we uh, programmers. Uh, you know, the Wright brothers didn't model flight after a bird. Um, we don't. We haven't modeled submarine de, submarine design af, after whales. We've taken our principles from from how whales work and how birds work to uh, develop things like flight and and submarines. Um, right now, we're taking principles of what we anticipate intelligence is and applying those principles to programming. And there's kind of a a top-down approach, clever programming will carry the day and, and achieve human level intelligence, or bottom-up, reverse engineering, the brain will carry the day for human level intelligence. But um, in in the top-down scenario, uh, consciousness isn't really necessary, and um, w what we'll get is always, I think, a, uh, a simulation of human intelligence, um, but not exactly the real thing. And that makes it even more alien. And as I wrote in our final invention, there's a lot of reasons to think that uh, whatever intelligence we're able to create will be very alien to ours. Um, there's there's the, the issue of complexity that this is a, co a cognitive architecture capable of simulating human intelligence would be probably the most complex creation ever made, and there are problems that go with complexity. There's a great book called Nor Normal Accidents by Charles Perrault that's just about complexity uh, causing uh, failures in, 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 uh, in systems like, like, like nuclear uh, refineries. Um, and the other, thing are, the, other, the other thing is that we'll be using a lot of black box systems in, in creating cognitive architectures. And those are systems like artificial neural nets, which are, you know, they're having a real spring right now, and, uh, and, and evolutionary algorithms. Both of those we know a lot about what the inputs are. We know a lot about what the, you know, we can see the outputs and adjust the outputs, in this case, intelligence, 
by changing the inputs, but we don't really know at a high resolution level what's going on inside. So we'll have issues of complexity um, and these issues of opacity. So we'll get a, an alien intelligence. We won't really know. Uh, I, th I think we're in danger of getting an alien intelligence. We, I think we're in danger of not knowing in a high resolution way how it works. And I think we'll get a very, a very fine simulation of human intelligence, but it may lack things like, like consciousness. And by the way, as everybody, as you know, everybody on this panel knows, consciousness is such a big kettle of fish. It's, it's a, it's a fabulous subject, but it's, uh, man, you can go down that path forever and get, and get nowhere. If I can also comment on that, which is that, um, a lot of times it seems like we fear more intelligence. Um, but, you know, I'll just give you one example that my friend, uh, Chris Robson, he's a Buddhist, Buddhist mathematician, and he likes to cite this example, which is, if you're walking down a dark street at night, and you see a big hulking guy coming down the street, you don't say, my God, I hope he's not intelligent. Right? <laughs> you kind of hope he is intelligent, because the threat isn't really intelligence. Right? So, in, in a way, consciousness could possibly be more helpful th than, than the lack of it, or, or the lack of intelligence um, is, is the bigger threat in some ways. But there needs to be a, a sufficient friendliness or a sufficient uh, willingness to see us as uh, creatures who deserve to continue to exist on this planet, whereas the scenarios we're looking at are that uh, intelligent systems, whether they are militarized drones or whether they are other algorithms that have uh, exceeded what we predicted for them, that they will regard humans as somehow irrelevant or dangerous or just uh, something that uh, gets in, in their way. So more than intelligence is needed, isn't it? And this comes to the real crux of this matter. So what should we be doing to uh, head off the, the risks that at some stage in the next few decades that uh, th these scenarios that we've talked about uh, will com come into reality. What are the steps that we should be taking now indeed to uh, prepare or to change the course of AI research? So what do each of you recommend as practical steps to be taken and why? So what I've, what I've been doing myself is uh, uh, supporting a so-called existential risk ecosystem, that is, uh, uh, organizations and people who are uh, you know, looking into issues uh, such as uh, risk from, from AI, but also from other, other potentially devastating technologies. Uh, and uh, like, I mean, like, because uh, AI risk and, and uh, existential risk in general have this tragedy of common situation where there is no possible way to profit uh, from making progress uh, in reducing existential risk. Uh, therefore, people and organizations in this uh, existential risk scene are very underfunded. Therefore, like if you want to make an uh, actual difference uh, in the world, like in the, in the future of the world, uh, like donating to existential risk organizations is a fairly uh, easy way to do so. Uh, and the other thing that I've been uh, doing is uh, actually going and talking uh, to different AI developers uh, and, and making sure that they at least are thinking about these issues. And I, I'm really glad that, uh, uh, that uh, things seem to be progressing. When I, when I started uh, uh, this discussion with, uh, uh, with different AI developers, uh, I think it was like five years ago or so, uh, like the common response was, uh, was uh, Kind of uh, ironically described by a friend of mine, Eliezer Rutkowski, said that it's very hard. He said that it's very hard to describe something to someone whose job depends on not understanding it. Uh, so, but I, I think there's like a great progress uh, uh, in the last few years when the like the awareness of this issue has uh, definitely spread. And for example, the, at the Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risk uh, that I co-founded uh, with uh, uh, Martin Rees and Hugh Price, uh, we just recently added one really mainstream uh, uh, AI, develop AI researcher, uh, Stuart Russell, uh, who has written the, who has like co-written the AI, sort of modern AI Bible, AI, the modern approach, uh, together with uh, uh, 
uh, Nordic uh, to our advisory board. So I think there's, uh, there's definitely uh, like positive uh, progress there. Yeah, I think it's I think it's important to acknowledge some of these organizations in case the uh, people who are watching don't know them. Um, Elias Yukowski, who actually I want to somebody attributed a quote from him to me, it was very flattering a little while ago. He he's the one who said the AI does not love you nor does it hate you, but it may have other uses for your atoms. And his organization is called MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Um, there's another organization. Uh, and then they're, I think they're the, at the forefront right now of, of working on friendly AI and working on a on a uh, an assortment of ways to deal with um, sharing the planet with superhuman intelligence and shaping that future. Uh, there, then there's the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford, and there's uh, and and Yan's group, um, the. Uh, the Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risk. So these are, or, or, are organizations that uh, are really swimming upstream, you know, while, while against uh, the way the current is flowing right now. If you, a, a while ago we mentioned how well funded some of these organizations are that are aiming for AGI, IBM, Google, DARPA, the NSA, and then uh, then there's, there's groups like, like the ones we just mentioned, MIRI and FHI and the Cambridge Center. That, that, that aren't so well funded, and meanwhile, uh, the the advocates for for friendly AI are are the underfunded ones, and the other guys are the ones who are making AI that's going to be decidedly unfriendly. While we're while we're grappling with the problem of, of, of friendliness, uh, there there are people who are just who are working day and night to make uh, autonomous killer drones, uh, battlefield robots. And, and advanced AI that's pointedly unfriendly, they'll be very disappointed if, uh, if, if, if their robots turn out to be super friendly robots. Um, so, the, I, you know, I, I think the audience needs to take note of, uh, of these organizations and support them. So there is some progress in some of these organizations which uh, have got a little bit more attention and funding than before. But as you've said, there are very large uh, commercial organizations, there are very large uh, military organizations who are plowing ahead at a much greater rate of knots. And even though there might be improvements in our understanding of what a friendly AI might be, there is much more likely to be improvements in the capabilities of AI. So, I mean, this brings us to another approach, which is that we raise people's awareness of it in a wider sense by writing interesting books and films about this. So, I'm a William, and uh, you have written uh, three novels on this subject. Uh, it, uh, it, what's your motivation behind writing on this subject, and what would you recommend to address some of the questions and risks that we've been talking about already? I mean, one of my motivations, I don't think it necessarily started out when I wrote my first book. I really just wanted to write a good story. Um, but since then, it's developed into just get more people thinking about it. Um, and I did a recent Singularity one-on-one -on -one, uh, podcast with Nicola, and you know that was my message. We just need more people in the world thinking about this thing that's a you know worldwide risk. Uh, one of the things I'm hoping for is that we'll actually have research into an ethical framework. Um, there's lots of people who think about ethics in humans, right? So we need to think about what it means for ethics for computers. Uh, and there's lots of mechanisms that we know that work in the human community, everything from um, you know, education, uh, peer influence, uh, religion, right? All of these things have influences on people's ethical framework. Now, uh, what's the equivalent for machines? And you know, one of the great things about uh, the argument of, um, you know, that super intelligent AI just wants our atoms is, you know, what? There's this great religion, uh, Jainism, right? It's one of the world's oldest religions in which, you know, the people sweep the streets in front of them um, so they don't accidentally step on an ant as they walk. Uh, if we could have AI <laughs> that were adherents of this religion, right? well, they wouldn't take our atoms. Uh, they'd do everything they could not to avoid us. So I know that sounds kind of silly, but at some level, right, if, if we're really going to have super intelligent AI, we need them to have that kind of an ethical framework that says even the ants have to live because we will be as ants to them. Colin, what's your answer to that question? What should we be doing to accelerate uh, safety in AI and AGI rather than just uh, greater capabilities? Well, sadly, I don't think we should rely on the idea that 
the more intelligent uh, an entity or a species gets, the kind of beneficent it is. There were a lot of very smart people at the senior levels of the Nazi party in the Second World War. What they did was obviously appalling. Uh, bright people sometimes are well-meaning and sometimes they're not. Bright AI may be well-meaning, it may not. I also don't think we can stop it if it's going to happen. Um, relinquishment is not an option. We can't stop this process happening. Um, and I, I struggle to see how Miri, the group in California which is trying to, using mathematical techniques, program friendliness into, into AI. I struggle to see how that can succeed. We, three, four thousand years after the Greeks started debating human ethics, have not come up with a, a global system of, of ethics which everybody agrees with. Any single ethical nostrum is fiercely debated. Um, there is no agreement among ourselves about what, what our ethics should be. So I don't understand how we could program into a computer. Um, I have a couple of specific thoughts about what we should do. Um, not, not original, but all of these things have been discussed by innumerable other people. Um, one is, I think, that it would be advantageous if the first AI is modeled on a human. Now, there's a number of different ways that, um, that strong AI or AGI is being developed. One of, one of them is to scan a human brain and reverse engineer it. So you, thin a, you, 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 you slice a human brain incredibly thinly, you work out where all the neurons are, and you rebuild the connectome inside a model. If we do it that way, there's some chance that the first AGI will be something like us. It will think a bit like us. Uh, it will, in a sense, perhaps be one of us, uploaded. And I think that that may lead to it having more empathy with us than might otherwise be the case. The other thing I think um, would probably be a good idea is for the first AGI and the first AGIs to be AGIs in a box. Now, I know there, is, there are problems with this idea, or there are people who think it's not possible. What I mean by it is the AI is uh, in, a, in a computer, and it cannot interact with the outside world. It can't do anything to the material world. Uh, it can just communicate with, with humans. It can't manipulate the atoms in the outside world. Now, there's all sorts of questions about would we be, really be able to contain a superintelligence in, in a limbo like this? Uh, would it be cruel to contain a, 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 an AGI in a, in a limbo like this? But I think at least initially, until we know what the thing is like, to prevent it from blowing us up or taking over the internet and crashing our civilization, sounds to me like a, a sensible precaution. Um, it seems to me to have more aspects of success than trying to program friendliness, whatever that means, into a computer. Into a, into a well, AI. you know, Miri does more things than trying to program friendliness, and they they uh, they have a. I urge everyone to have a look at their at their website. Uh, I think it's intelligence.org. But uh, they do they do more than 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 uh, try to program friendliness. I also think it's troublesome to think that uh, you could keep something in a box that was thousands or millions of times more intelligent than, than its keepers. I think it would use, I, in fact, I start uh, the, the book, Our Final Invention, with a scenario, and I equate it to the, to, uh, uh, the AGI is so intelligent, is it's as if a human woke up in uh, being imprisoned by mice. Um, it wouldn't take long for, the, for that human, uh, mice that you could communicate with, and it wouldn't take long for that human to figure out the, the, mice, the mouse's weak point. So something thousands or millions of times more intelligent than us wouldn't, wouldn't struggle with that. There is, um, I see hope in uh, something uh, that I first heard of through Ray Kurzweil, and that's in the 1970s, there was a meeting of people working on recombinant DNA in, uh, at the Aslamar uh, Center in California. They came away, they, they got together because, and they stopped research, and they all agreed to get together and develop very basic protocols like don't track the DNA out on your shoes. And the, the, those ASMR guidelines held. They all went back to work. They took the ASMR guidelines. And now we've got promising gene therapies. We've got promising you know, got beneficial crops. We've got a lot of things that happen from good recombinant DNA. We need that kind of cooperation among people who are making, who aim to make AGI. 
we need a kind of, I think, we need a kind of IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency, but with a public-private partnership among the, the major players who are creating AGI. And we need to get them together. We need to get them, uh, I know it's, it's a tall order, but to get them to be transparent about their procedures and at least to tell each other what's going on. We need to treat it like a real dual-use technology, like nuclear fission. Um, you know, nuclear fission really started out the same way. It was a splitting the atom was a promising way to get free energy in the 20s and 30s. But the world learned about nuclear fission at Hiroshima. Right now, we all love our smartphones. We love all the all the applications of AI that are coming around. I'm gonna. I'd love a self-driving car, uh, but just as quickly, advanced AI is being weaponized, and uh, its 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 potential for destruction is far greater than fission. So I think we need to we need to if we if we take it uh, if we take it as seriously as we take fission, then we need to follow fission's uh, record not of success. I mean, fission was hold, we held a, you know the human race held a gun at our own heads for 50 years. We need a better maintenance plan for advanced artificial intelligence. We need to take it that seriously. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, about the sort of AI boxing, you're putting AI, AI in the box. Like my partner at Meta met uh, Michael Vassar, who used to, uh, was a previous president of Mary, has this funny quote saying that, uh, like, uh, uh, super intelligence uh, that wakes up in, in a box built by humans is the equivalent of a human waking up in a prison that has been built by a bunch of blind five-year-olds who know nothing about vision nor prisons. That said, uh, there's there's still uh, uh, it's it's not still as black and white. Like all else being equal, we still want the AI to be in a box. And and also actually there like in Future Humanity Institute and Mary, there is actually some rigorous thinking uh, being applied to like what does it take uh, to box an AI. And uh, so there are some interesting ideas. For example, you can use so-called uh, homomorphic encryption. That is, you, you put uh, like a mathematically provable layer between between the sort of inside of the box and outside of the box. That's actually uh, you can't really causally control because the mechanisms are there's like an encryption layer between between the two two models. Uh, and also, like uh, you don't talk to the AI. But you get information just bit by bit. You get, get ask ask it just yes and no no questions, and and uh, this basically limits uh, like you basically isolate it as much as as possible. Uh, that said, this still uh, like uh, assumes that uh, we know the laws of physics better than than it, it does, uh, mm -hmm. or at, at the same level. It might still like kind of just figure figure out things about the world that we just have no idea about. And, and therefore, like all our precautions uh, are just uh, out the window. So it might find alternative ways to propagate itself outside of the constraints that we think are uh, foolproof, because it knows more about physics or communication yeah, systems. Basically, basically, it sees causal uh, pathways that we just uh, haven't figured out that exist. And that's in addition to the other risk, which has been pointed out by Eliezer Yudkowsky, and which, James, in fact, you cover in your book, the possibility that the AI in the box will have a sufficient uh, knowledge of human psychology to be able to, in many cases, persuade the human guards that it would be better for that uh, AI to gain more access to the outside world. Of course, and this goes to, this goes to a couple of really important points. Um, I mean, during the AI's development, presumably it will have an ontology like, like Watson does. It will have a common sense database. It will have studied the contents of the internet. It will have a knowledge of social engineering. So as I said in the book, if, you know, if Stephen King can scare us sleepless, then imagine what something a thousand times or a million times smarter than Stephen King could do in order to coerce his way out of the box. Um, I think any means of trying to, trying to contain uh, a superintelligence are temporary. Um, Ray Kurzweil himself said, there's no way you can ultimately contain smarter than human intelligence. It's just a matter of time. And, you know, it, it, if, we, if we set up that dilemma, then we only have to fail really once. Um, so it's not, I don't think that that's a solution. I think, I, I'm, you know, I, one of the criticisms of my book, Our Final Invention, is that I don't have a lot of solutions, and that's, it's, it's true. But I think uh, 
the beginning of solution is to is openness and cooperation among people who are really after the AGI uh, goal. You know, one of the principles of computer security is this notion of defense in depth that I have um, systems to monitor the traffic that's coming in over the network. I have other, uh, you know, firewalls on the outside of the network that I have um, something that's monitoring what's coming into my computer, um, and then I have something that's monitoring what's running on my computer, right? Virus checkers, um, firewalls at multiple levels. And one of the reasons for defense in depth is because any one attack could compromise one of those things. Uh, and like James just said, we could have 10,000 AI in a box, but if the box is the only level of security we have, it only takes one AI that's not in the box to mess everything up. So we need to have solutions to this at all the layers of the ecosystem. We need to, maybe we do need a box, but we're also going to need, you know, fail safes at the level of the internet, you know, so we can cordon this thing off no matter where it is if it's a problem, or um, fail safes for our cars so that our cars aren't being driven by one central AI, but they have a fail back mode where they can you know, resort to manual behavior or shut down safely or things like that. This is going to require a lot of international saying. cooperation to get these uh, systems put in place. The kind of cooperation that James was talking about, uh, similar to the constraints on the development of genetics modifications. Is that credible that we're going to be able to do this when there are so many uh, agents, uh, whether they're military or commercial, that want to go as ahead uh, as fast as possible and we'll see any of these constraints as interference and bureaucracy and uh, uh, impediments? Yeah, no, it's not, it's not credible. It's not credible to hope that every government, every military um, Course, every company, every super rich individual around the world will agree to any set of standards, uh, whether it be to hold back from developing an AGI, whether it be to um, try to program them in, in some particular way. Um, vanquishment, uh, which has been urged by some people, it just, it's just not a feasible option. On the subject of the Oracle AI, yeah, it, it has its problems, but if we're so worried about this thing that if we think it's good, you know, if it gets out into the wild, we're all doomed then um, it's better if it's not in the wild, even if we're going to have to work really hard on thinking how we keep it in its box for a while until we know what it's like and know what its motivations are. There is a lot of work going on in this area. As Jan said, um, one, of, one of the smartest groups of people in this field is the Future of Humanity Institute, who work mostly with MIRI. And I'm not denigrating MIRI, by the, by the way. They're very, very smart people doing very important work. Um, Nick Bostrom, who is the head of the Future of Humanity Institute, has a, what I suspect is going to be a very important book coming out in July this year on superintelligence. Um, Nick has spent a lot of time and effort thinking about AGI in general and about the idea of an Oracle AI or an AI in a box in particular. Um, and I think that you know he may advance, he may in that book. Uh, tell us some of the things he's been thinking about and, and show us some ways forward. Frankly, if we're going to have an AGI, and we may well be going to have one, we need to be able to control it. So we probably need to have several approaches uh, running in parallel. We need to have the international mm -hmm. cooperation. We need to develop uh, more security mechanisms to keep AIs uh, in, under some kind of control, at least. And then we need to consider the ethics of, of robotics, uh, ethics of uh, human uh, artificial intelligence as well. A couple of words on the logistics of this call. So for those who are following along, uh, most of you, uh, many of you have found the Q&A uh, section of the Google Plus page. Uh, you can uh, submit your questions in there. You can uh, add plus one votes to the questions that are uh, already in place. If you're watching on YouTube, you should find a link at the bottom of the YouTube page to take you instead to that Google Plus page. Uh, I have to confess that every time I do one of these uh, Hangouts in there, there's a different technical thing that goes wrong. So in this case, uh, interestingly, uh, my Chrome window uh, has gone unresponsive. So I am no longer able to scroll up and down the list of questions. I'm no longer able to chat uh, by text to the other panelists. So if some of the other panelists have been asking me questions in the text window, wondering why I haven't responded, it's because <laughs> that uh, this system uh, has had its own uh, kind of uh, bug. 
bug in this case, and it's a different bug every time. But uh, even though I can't uh, click on a question to say this is the question we're now answering, I am able uh, by other means to keep an eye on that list of questions, and uh, I ask all the panelists to be aware of what these other questions are, and where appropriate we can feed some of our comments in the direction of, of these questions. The question I want to continue along the line now is to follow along the suggestion that Callum made that a building an AI based on a whole brain emulation is a inherently a safer approach because it's more likely to be similar in its attributes and in its character to human ethics and morals because it's based on an actual human being as opposed to something that's been uh, reverse engineered, uh, uh, well, something that's been engineered in a different way and which might therefore be quite alien. Do panelists have views as to whether this whole brain emulation uh, approach to generating the first AI is credible and is the best approach? Well, I, I definitely agree that it's, it's like if you Mi closely mimic a human, uh, the danger of uh, getting a completely alien result is much lower. Uh, that, that said, there still are risks that are uh, specific to uh, you know, human uploads. Uh, well, not specific, but like you still get a certain uh, level of alienness uh, even uh, in human uploads. For example, they are able to uh, make copies of themselves. They are able to experiment on, on themselves uh, and, and therefore like uh, figure out how to enhance their intelligence uh, so, so it's, uh, it's, it's still possible and they are like, able to run like much faster than, than we are given uh, given that there's uh, hardware hardware available so it's, it's by no means kind of a, a sure fire uh, safety approach but I definitely agree that, that it, it uh, seems much much safer. Than, uh, than all the, uh... I'm not so sure of that uh, because I'm just I'm just worried about the whole thing. But I'm not so sure, and, and that's because um, we have a lot of psychopaths. <laughs> we have a mammalian basis for aggression that machines don't have. Don't upload um, them. What's that? Don't upload them then. Yeah, well, you know, how do you, how do you know? How do you you know? Um, the way you know, sure. what's 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 interesting about the whole. Um, the transhumanist movement is we know the first person who will probably be augmented will be a, be a wealthy person. Well, is that wealthy person going to, is he going to, are we going to vote that person into being uh, uploaded or his brain augmented or super intelligence be given to that person? Um, how is it going to come about? We know how technology is adapted by wealthy people first. Um, and in my book, I point out a study that basically says, well, it's, you know, we used to, we used to, we used to just assume that wealthy people weren't, weren't as nice for some reason. It was just a, this egalitarian instinct. But it turns out they're not as nice. And they've done some psychology tests to, uh, to, to illustrate that. So I'm not so sure. I think that reverse engineering the brain or taking groups of circuits, uh, uh, neurons, duplicating, creating them as, as circuits, and then turning those circuits into algorithms is probably the fastest way. I'm not so sure it's the safest way. I'm not. I'm not sure there's a giant difference between uh, between um, reverse engineering an actual human brain and doing it the bottom-up approach or the top-down approach. Uh, I'm, I'm. I'm just. I'm not quite convinced yet. And I think you know, as we get closer to it, we'll see. Uh, we'll get more evidence uh, on which on which route would be safer. I'd be yeah, what the first human to be uploaded, if that is the route we go down, I'd be very surprised if it was a rich person. Because if I was, let's say, Larry Page at Google, uh, I wouldn't want to be the first person to be uploaded. I wanted to, I'd want to see somebody else experimented on first. So the first, uh, the first few uploads, and probably until we get to the first successful upload, um, are, are probably not going to be the wealthy people who, who command all the resources. They will perhaps preserve their brains in some other way until the uploading process has been proved. Also, the first person to be uploaded is, is almost certainly going to be a dead person um, because scanning a live brain is really, really hard. You need very advanced nanotechnology to do that. Uh, scanning a dead person where you simply slice the, the brain into very thin slices, um, that uh, is, is not something that anybody could recover from, so it's going to be a dead person. Um, and I think you can 
choose the first person or the first few people because sadly it's probably going to take quite a few goes to get it right. Um, you can probably, I, th I think you probably can be confident of screening out the psychopaths. The risk is that although the person may not appear to be a psychopath, they may appear to be quite a saintly person, but you give them more and more power, then uh, power tends to corrupt, doesn't it? And even a saintly person may turn into a bit of a psychopath in such a circumstance. <laughs> yeah, if that, if that happens, we're screwed, frankly. In there, I mean, there, there will be differences. Um, we're not going to get it all right. They're not going to be embodied in a human flesh and body thing, which means that they're going to have, uh, you know, their relationships are going to suffer, their experience of the world is going to change, um, and that would be a pretty stressful thing for any person to experience. So, um, there's, you know, you could have a perfectly normal people that's going to have some kind of psychotic episode as, the, as a result of it, um, and do very harmful things if they're able to. Yeah, what if, what if super intelligence turns out to be a, a, an aggression multiplier? I mean, we have no idea what it does to our psyche, and and that's that's a you know how does our psychology evolve over millions of years in in a to operate in, in a very linear way? How does it adapt to uh, to super augmentation? I'm not sure if it even does. Um, of course, this is all pretty speculative ter terrain. We're we're looking deep into the future at techniques to upload brains. I'm not sure we can we can say anything with great definition about that. A friend of mine, uh, Robin Hanson, uh, who is a professor at George Mason University, has uh, is, has been writing a book for a while uh, about uh, what would a society with human uploads uh, be be like. And there, he actually makes a. Like, I don't think that he paints a very plausible picture, but uh, when while thinking through things, he actually makes several great points there. For example, one point that uh, that people don't realize is that. Uh, once we get the technology to upload people, I mean, people in general will not be uploaded. There will be like a couple of dozen people in the world who will be uploaded and made copies of, because like because there's there's going to be this uh, this, this this technology is going to be uh, expensive and it's going to be a power multiplier. Therefore, like you you have what to be very carefully picking the people uh, from kind of top performing. But you want to pick top performing people and make lots of copies of them uh, instead of like doing this kind of uh, egalitarian or, or a democratic uh, upload, be, upload process or making the uploads available as a service or something like that. Therefore, like vast majority of science fiction gets it completely wrong uh, because, of, because of the just the economics uh, doesn't support kind of wide uploads, democratic uploads. Well, a lot of technologies start out being very expensive and then they, they get radically cheaper. Cars started like that. Airplanes started like that. You know, you don't make loads and loads of money by making uh, toys for a few very rich people. You can make decent money doing that, but you make the really big money by making toys for everybody. Yeah, and, but, but um, Robin Hanson's uh, point is that uh, that uh, once you have uh, a human society working uh, as uploads, this society will have its own economy. It will no longer be a part of the part of the large large economy because why would it be? Right, right. If you when I hear this discussion about whole brain emulation, uh, part of me thinks, well, gosh, this is quite a few decades into the future. We're not likely to be close to whole brain emulation for maybe 20 or 30 years. Is there a worry about uh, other forms of AI becoming more dangerous in the shorter term? We discussed earlier about the risks for military intelligence and drones. Uh, drones which have more and more autonomy. They can make decisions about potential enemies uh, without needing to refer back to their human uh, overseers. And then in some circumstances they might uh, go amok. We also had discussions earlier about uh, artificial intelligence driving trading algorithms, uh, the, trying to figure out ways of making money by indeed emulating the whole of the stock exchange, emulating the ideas of other actors in the stock exchange and figuring out which series of trades might be most uh, amenable. And then uh, we've already seen some of the damage that's been caused by some of these uh, AIs in the short term and uh, if they are more powerful in uh, 10 years time, potentially the damage could be much, much more severe. So are, are there short term issues and worries uh, about uh, the growing uh, super intelligence which uh, could not wait for a solution such as whole brain emulation? 
Well, you know, the, the ethicist Wendell Wallace at, at uh, Yale University anticipates that we'll have some sort of accident caused by autonomous systems in the next few years. And, you know, in some ways that would be a good thing because if we get an accident with, um, with, with AI that's less than, than general, with uh, something like an autonomous uh, battlefield robot or an autonomous drone, if we start having accidents with those systems, it will alert everybody to the danger of advanced AI. Um, I, I see I see a lot of accidents coming down the road with, um, you know, we look at, we, and it's not just, you know, I, I actually am a big AI fan. I like um, the, the, the technology is absolutely uh, stimulating, entrancing, hypnotizing. It's the deepest look we take uh, this, any of the, among any of the sciences at the most inward look at our own psychology, our own motivation, our, our, who we are and how our brains work. Um, but I see uh, problems coming up with, with uh, the, those applications in, in, in the military. And I, I see that we're going to have the, the first people. You know, if you look at, if you look at the, the problem is not really the technology, it's really how we apply it. The NSA was using data mining algorithms to, to to collate our metadata, to, to get your address book and mine, and also to, to, to sift through the entire transmission contents of the internet. This is a godlike power that they, they acquired and then abused. And so it's, the technology is not inherently dangerous. It's, it's the way we're going to use it. And I see, as, as, as you mentioned a minute ago, David, um, big problems coming down the pike with the, the militarization, the weaponization of advanced AI. If, and fortunately, I think this, that's going to be chastening. I think that's going to, we're going to learn from that. And more people are going to get uh, into the conversation. I would wish that uh, this NSA conversation were uh, transformed into an advanced AI conversation so that people could see, you know, here's a normal person. Here's a normal person with given one godlike power, the ability to sift through an ocean of data and pull out actionable intelligence. So what happens is, it's abused. Um, these guys were they, they were creating um, dossiers on their ex-girlfriends. They were uh, they were they were basically suspending the First and Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. So I'd like to see you know in terms of, of getting the getting the some of the message out. I'd like to see people writing about hey wait a minute this isn't just an average technology. This isn't a, a toaster problem. This isn't a dishwasher problem. This is an advanced AI problem. But if I can just uh, continue this discussion with you, James, because uh, you wrote in the, near the end of the book some very interesting things about malware, uh, potentially malware which uh, was involved in shutting down some of the Iranian nuclear reactors, which sounds fantastic because it's a very, very clever and very sophisticated malware, but it equally is a dual-use uh, system. Uh, you're proposing a minute ago that we may have some horrible things happening in the relatively near time, which wouldn't be so globally horrible that it would be the end game, but it would waken us up. What What are your worries and fears about a uh, malware, uh, which could uh, give us all a shock? Sure, sure. Well, Stuxnet. Uh, if anyone wants to Google Operation Olympic Games, they'll see that Stuxnet and a suite of uh, malware called uh, Dooku Flame were created over the last uh, eight or nine years by the United States, the NSA again, and a, and a secret Israeli organization. I see the nexus of malware and AI to be really problematic and, up, and coming up fast. Stuxnet was one example of that in my mind. I know it was, isn't technically AI, but it does some pretty, it did some pretty, some pretty remarkable autonomous things. The problem with Stuxnet was that it attacks, it was sent to, uh, it was it infiltrated through spies, uh, a, a nuclear uh, a refiner, a plutonium refinery in Iraq, maybe two of them. Uh, then, it, then it, it attacked those, uh, those, the, those, these industrial controllers, these Siemens-built industrial controllers at these plants, and it compromised them and it ruined these, these uh, centrifuges. Well, those same, those exact same Siemens-built controllers un power our energy grid. There are 90 different companies that run our energy grid in the United States. All of them use the same model number of Siemens built controller. So what the NSA did was give a, uh, a, a capability, of course, and this is another, another good analogy to, to advanced artificial intelligence, Stuxnet escaped the, the refineries and it, it got out on the internet and attacked 10,000 other 
Siemens built controllers in the world, those people had a copy of the Stuxnet virus. Um, and so basically it can be re it can be repurposed and used to attack our energy grid. So that's the kind of problem, you know, it was a very, very sophisticated weapon that we used to attack Iran, or, uh, to attack Iran, the Iranian nuclear fires, that can be repurposed and used against us. And that's the kind of hubris and arrogance that I, th I think we can, we can, uh, we'll, we'll see ahead in the development of these, uh, of, of AI weapons. Um, the, the Russian uh, malware expert Kaspersky estimated that Stuxnet reduced the cost of an attack on our grid from ten million dollars to one million dollars because he basically gave it a, a uh, gave it a delivery system. We need a new warhead, but he gave, basically gave a delivery system to anybody smart enough to 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 work on it. So I see those sorts of accidents happening, and I hope that I hope that uh, those are and I think that those will be survivable and hopefully chasing them. William, uh, maybe I can bring you in on this because when you in your three books you have three different scenarios as I remember for how AGI of various sorts might emerge. Uh, all of them in the what ten years? Uh, well, in a, in quite a short number of years, and one of them, in fact, involving malware. I wonder what your views are. I mean, is this just a fiction, or are, are, are there credible scenarios involving uh, the, the, these technologies which could cause uh, major meltdowns in our global systems? Um, there's no doubt that it's credible and that we already see the problem today, not just with Stuxnet, but um, there I cannot remember the name of it. There was another government piece of malware designed to spy on users' computers, um, which very quickly was compromised by, um, you know, guys running botnets who wanted to use, who just basically hijacked the back door into the malware so that they could get users' data off of their computers. So it's like as, as quickly as this stuff is created, it's abused not just by the creators but by anyone else who taps into it. So I, I see that. Um, and, and virus writers have, have a very big incentive. Um, there's a lot of money at stake for them and what they can make out of it. So they're investing in it too, right? And it's a, it's a different attack on AI. Uh, and, and the goals are, you know, all nefarious, right? They're, they're, <laughs> they're not trying to make a friendly virus. They're, they're trying to make uh, the most malevolent one possible and the most viral one possible. So they're advancing that area and, and you know in my book what I write about is those viruses evolving. At some point in time someone writes a virus that um, basically takes the best of all other computer viruses uh, and so it keeps evolving over time. Look like you wanted to say something James? Oh, I was just going to point out just to reinforce what William said in 2010 and every year since, the malware industry uh, has grossed more than the drug, uh, the illegal drug industry globally. So people are making it's a, it's bigger than 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 illegal drugs, um, and it will get, continue to get bigger and bigger. The internet, as somebody at the Dep Department of Defense pointed out to me, uh, the internet is um, was never meant for defense. It was never designed to be. Uh, to be impermeable, and so it's a big, it's you know, it's it's a it's a a, a, a very uh, rich resource for, for people who are up to no good. I'm finding this discussion a bit pessimistic, to be to be frank. You know, and we're we're coming up with tentative solutions as to how we can head off these risks. But it seems that there's a great deal more work that needs to be done. Maybe that's uh, just the the answer. You know, we we have to raise people's attention to these issues, and then we have to engage gradually more and more people. But uh, since we're against some of the world's largest industries, whether they are above the board industries or under the board industries, black markets and so on, we we seem to have be fighting against the very large. Uh, Large enemies, indeed. Yeah, well, you were suggesting. We're, I'm not sure we've. Sorry, go on. You oh. yeah. Sorry, Callum. Sorry, um, I'm not sure we're fighting against the AGI industry. I think we're trying to. Um, you know, I think the ideal is to have people working with them to make sure that their outcomes are uh, favourable to us. And you're right; there is a lot of potential pessimism about this. Um, I think probably one of the things that everybody in the panel is trying to do is to raise awareness of these issues such that more people get thinking about them because you know one thing we know is two bins are better than one and two million brains are better than 20. There are some very smart people 
already work, working on these issues. We've, we've listed some of them today. Um, but if we could have have a decent proportion of the whole human race thinking about this, then we, you know, we've got a better chance of figuring out a safe way forward. Yeah, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we launched uh, an essay contest, a essay contest uh, together with an organization called FQXI, Fundamental Questions uh, Institute, uh, and there are uh, decent prizes uh, uh, for the winners there. And uh, we deliberately uh, wanted to uh, talk about existential risks. We wanted to wanted to uh, essay contest to be about existential risks, uh, but uh, we also uh, decided to formulate uh, it in a kind of positive light, a positive manner. So instead of asking uh, what are the like the worst things that can happen to us, uh, we actually asking what are the best things that can happen to us and what are the risks on our way there. So, so like, if anybody is interested, look up the essay contest. How can we find more details about that essay contest, Jan? Uh, yeah, you can go uh, FQXI, it's uh, Fundamental uh, Questions Institute. FQXI? Yeah, FQXI.org. All right, we'll post a link to that afterwards. You've just because the essay contest can help members here. Members of the panel, Jan. Hmm? Uh, are members of the panel allowed to enter, enter this competition? Uh, I think so. <laughs> Right. So I'm, uh, I, I'm reminded a little bit too of a talk that Cory Doctorow gave on the topic of privacy, uh, which is one of his areas of passion. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that privacy uh, in in the computer world is it's a little bit like ensuring a good water supply. So in theory, um, you could uh, you know harvest the water off of your roof put it in a cistern, uh, purify it, and you could make your own drinking water. But it's definitely far more efficient to have uh, the government do that for you, right? And he was talking about that for privacy. Yes, you could go to extraordinary lengths to uh, secure your own privacy on the internet, but it can be far more efficient if the government mandates that privacy, makes it part of the infrastructure. Um, in, in many ways, it does seem like that is also going to be a theme of, of AGI and artificial intelligence, which is, yeah, there could be things that we do individually, but uh, that's going to be very hard uh, compared to having something that's mandated from the top down. So I feel like uh, ultimately this is a conversation we have to get governments on board with um, that will make these rules that apply across the board. I, I, I agree 100 percent, but I think the way to get governments on board is to hit, is to make the voters aware of these issues. And I think you know one of the big pushes for me is to get is to try and translate this sometimes very technical language and conversation into uh, plain English so that uh, more people can understand it. And then more people can get can, can realize that a, you know AI isn't just it's not a movie. It's not it's it is a movie. it's not just a movie. It's uh, it's it's everyone's lives, and once you once you get people educated, I look at the AI conversation right now a little bit like global warming back in the 80s. You know, it takes it takes a it, it takes an inconvenient truth to kind of bolster it into the to the front lines. Um, and it what this what uh, this conversation I think is going to take is a lot of people working to to uh, humanize and popularize the conversation. So that you get more people, because I think I, I I agree with you that we need government uh, we need governments involved, unfortunately, but we need I think private public partnerships because that's the only way you're going to get corporations involved. Um, but but to but to motivate the governments, you're going to need voters. You're going to need everybody understanding and taking part in this conversation. So you heard it here first. James Barrett is the Al Gore of the <laughs> the final invention scenario. Uh, well, that's not an entirely reassuring uh, comparison. <laughs> thanks, thanks for your book, uh, uh, James. Uh, sure. I, I hear rumors that you are going to turn it into a film, and you're going to go around the world and uh, <laughs> raise, raise. I mean, you're already doing it, doing so around the virtual world, uh, raise, raising awareness. But uh, the global warming scenario isn't entirely reassuring because, despite all the attention that's been given to global warming, uh, corporations, the oil industry, seem to be still headed uh, towards. Uh, uh, emitting more and more carbon. I don't want to get down that uh, particular debate now, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a long way to go, I think, and at least at least we have started. 
Uh, at least we're, we're making steps in that direction. We're almost out of time. I'm going to shortly ask each of you to give some closing remarks, the uh, points that you'd particularly like to emphasize, points that you'd like people to bear in mind. We haven't uh, done a great job of being able to address the questions from the audience, in part because of some technical issues which I mentioned earlier. But maybe you could, uh, some of you at least, address some of the most highly ranked questions. There's a question, for example, from Alexander Karan, who says that uh, actually, maybe we don't need to worry about this so much because uh, we're such a long way from understanding consciousness and uh, issues uh, will only arise uh, when we did understand consciousness and so uh, the, the counter to that is that you know uh, the, these uh, super intelligent uh, agents they don't need to be conscious but they still could uh, do a great deal of damage to us so that's one possible question to uh, feed into your answers let's have a, a round of final comments and, and maybe I'll start with uh, you William what are the kind of key takeaways you'd like people to, to have in mind you know I, I, what I would love most of all is uh, if people uh, could who, who are listening here could let at least one other person or two other people know about this topic um, buy them a copy of James's book or have them watch this <laughs> video or do something to um, to get them thinking about this issue because that's what we need more than anything else is just more people um, thinking about it and aware of it. And even though we don't have a definite uh, solution in mind today, uh, just making uh, people uh, waken up to the risks is a, is a start because once more people are aware of the risks then the more people will start thinking and debating about the solutions. Absolutely. Uh, Callum, can I ask you for uh, final comments and maybe answers to any of the questions that have been floating around? Yeah, I'd agree with William's very generous suggestion that people buy James's book. It's a, it's a, that would be a good <laughs> step. Um, we do need more people to be thinking about the fact that uh, conscious machines may well be on their way, and they may not like us, or they may damage us, whether they like us or not. We need, uh, as a species, to be thinking about this, and, and I guess. The, the final thought I'd like to leave in people's heads is uh, there's lots of good sound bites in this in this debate, um, and I think this is one we haven't heard yet. Which is uh, just because you saw it in the movies doesn't mean to say it can't happen. <laughs> so it may well happen, even though it was in the movies. Yes. It won't be quite like in the Terminator movie, because in the Terminator movies, the Terminators are only slightly more powerful and slightly more intelligent than humans, and the puny humans managed to fight back. And with a superhuman effort, they managed to defeat the superhumans. But in the reality, these devices would be potentially hundreds, thousands of times more powerful. So that part of the movie isn't likely to be credible. But other parts, maybe. Uh, Jan, can I ask you for some uh, final comments, points you'd like to emphasize? Uh, yeah, I wanted to actually say the same thing, that uh, science fiction is actually not uh, the best uh, way to uh, kind of, uh, prognosticate the future because it, it has this additional constraint of, uh, of needing to uh, be interesting story uh, from human perspective. Uh, and I also want to answer a couple of questions here, just quickly. Uh, like, AI becoming uh, automatically autonomous. Uh, yes, there is. Like, if you are, if you are looking into uh, like into code, you see that uh, whenever you're trying to create something that is uh, that uh, is uh, uh, navigating in the world or like figuring out what the possibilities are, it's actually hard to make it uh, uh, become not uh, like goal goal directed. It's it's there like automatically. Uh, and yeah, okay. Actually, actually, I will not uh, spend more time. But why, 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 you mentioned earlier, uh, Jan, about the organization you were involved in creating at Cambridge, the Cambridge mm -hmm. Center for Study of Existential Risks. Why, why did you feel the need for a new institution rather than just working with the existing ones, such as those uh, in uh, America, MIRI, and in Oxford at the FHI? Well, I think it's in, like my kind of general strategy uh, for saving the world, so to speak, is to create uh, like a sort of diverse ecosystem of different organizations. And there are several reasons for that. Like, for example, just to make sure that different avenues are explored. And, like, uh, and also, like, if some organization goes down because of some like, mismanagement or, or, uh, or some whatever uh, unfortunate issues, uh, there, are, there are places, alternative places for people to migrate to. So for example, like in, in particular, in academia, Future, Future Humanity Institute was so far the only organization 
therefore, like, uh, it's, it's really important to have redundancy for the future of Humanity Institute. So at a very minimal level, we, we just want to kind of replicate uh, uh, the, what, what Future of Humanity Institute is doing and perhaps like use this Cambridge-Oxford rivalry to kind of reset up the performance of those organizations. But also, even like, we haven't done actual research so far, but uh, I think Cambridge Institute already has greatly contributed to the discussion by basically providing a beacon or providing a canonical answer uh, to the question, existential risks, says who? You can go, go, to, the, go to the website and there's a like, list of very prominent people who say that this is an issue. And thanks. And uh, James, let me give the final comments to, to you. Oh, well, I, I think if, if, if my book does any service, it's, uh, it will, one of the services it does is have a look at the 30 pages of endnotes and you'll see organizations like MIRI and how to find out more, and more about them and organizations like the Future of Humanity Institute. Another person who comes up, I, I'm not capable of coming up with an optimistic scenario about, about what's going to happen, but there's a man who is, his name is Steve Amahundro, and I want to direct people to his website at Self-Aware Systems. Um, he has terrific, a terrific positive approach towards, towards uh, confronting the, really, the real existential risks we're facing with advanced AI. And the, the only thing I'd like to really say is um, there's a bunch of ways to, to get more knowledge about these issues. My books, Our Final Invention, is one of them, but the, a lot of work has been done you can go as deep or as shallow as you like, and you'll be rewarded by a lot of really interesting thinking. And it's it's it's, it's extremely timely. You know, I, I I I hate to scare people, but you know, objects in the mirror in the rearview mirror are a lot closer than they appear. Objects in the rearview mirror may be a lot closer than they appear. We might be having a much more serious discussion uh, sooner than we think about some of these uh, issues when they have boiled over much more into the public consciousness. Well, we hope not, but uh, it's far better to have a, a small scale than to suddenly discover that we're in a terrible, terrible situation. Maybe I should get Steve Omohundra into a future one of these uh, London Futures Hangout on Air. This topic is by no means uh, finished. In fact, it's only just started. But uh, the time for the discussion now has come to an end. I want to thank all the panelists for uh, giving their time. Thank everybody for raising questions, even though we couldn't uh, answer uh, so many of them directly. I think we fed a lot of them indirectly into the conversation and by all means raise them again in other forums when you have an opportunity to do so there. So let's hope that uh, we will raise more attention quickly. Uh, in London, in the 22nd and 23rd of March, we will be addressing at least some of these questions in the course of the London Futurist Conference known as Anticipating 2025, when the subject of existential risks is high on the agenda, and we even have at least one talk by uh, Callum, and possibly other speakers will address it too, on uh, this issue as well. So if you are likely to be in or near London, uh, in late March. I encourage you to check out Anticipating 2025, uh, the conference. And also, please keep your eye on the London Futurist site for more Hangouts on Air, which will be advertised shortly. Thanks to everybody, and uh, goodbye. Thank you very Thank much, you. David. Thank you. David.